Um, <laughs> name is Diogo Monica, I'm the security lead at Docker, and today I'm gonna be talking about Docker Content Trust. Docker Content Trust allows you to have image signing. So you can make sure that you're not running arbitrary code, you're actually running the code that you wanted to run in the first place. So before I go into the, the talk itself, uh, the agenda is very simple. I'm going to introduce you the need for image signing, but I'm not really gonna focus on the need because everybody knows that you have your signed your images. I'm really gonna focus on the need for a security framework around image signing. Then I'm gonna go over Tuff. Tuff is the update framework, which is essentially the core fundamental framework that we're using at Docker. Uh, we did not invent this framework. It was uh, invented in 2009 by a bunch of really smart researchers. I'm gonna go over um, Tuff a little bit. Then I'm gonna go over Notary which is an open source tool that we launched at DockerCon um, US that essentially is an opinionated implementation of Tuff. Finally, I'm gonna go over Docker Content Trust, which in itself is actually a very opinionated implementation of Notary. So Notary is the open source component, and Docker Content Trust essentially uses Notary to provide image signing. Great, so first things first. Every time I talk about image signing, every single time somebody in the audience or on Hacker News, Hacker News is a likelihood one of happening. Why not GPG? This question is always asked. And to be fair, this is actually a very unfair comparison to GPG. The reality of this is that GPG is in itself a message format. It's not really meant to provide security uh, on its own. It is an unfair comparison to compare GPG with an actual security framework whose objective is actually defending against our attacks on software downloads. The reality is that we could use GPG the same way that right now we're using CDSA, we're using DDSA or RSA PSS, right? They're not necessarily message formats, but it is a building block. It is not essentially the way that you do security. And for a good example of why you can't simply apply GPG directly to your RPM and have uh, signature of images, I, I have this image on the board. So imagine that you have a GPG key. You generate it. It has a duration of expiration of 10 years. And you sign your RPM. Perfect. All is good and well. Your servers verify the image. Everything is good. Two years later, you have a server that gets man in the middle. So now there's an attacker, two years later, with a privileged man in the, man in the middle position on your network. So now what the attacker is going to do is going to be really interesting. The attacker is in the network, and when one of your hosts is going to try to update one of the software packages, what the attacker is going to do is it's going to serve a valid signed package from two years ago. It's gonna serve you a package that has shell shock. And what is your host gonna do? Your host is gonna download it, verify the GPG key, and happily install it. So essentially, you use GPG, you have verification, but you're vulnerable to what we call a replay attack. So this is actually pretty bad, right? The reality of it is that it's a lot more to security of software distribution than simply signing a GPG image. GPG is a building block. And software distribution is actually really hard. There are virtually no systems out there that allow you to have package managers, that allow you to have guarantees over the freshness of content. They're complex to use, they do not surface the right level of abstraction, and they do not have the capability of survive key compromise. If that GPG key that I mentioned got compromised, you are essentially hosed. You have to go to your, every single one of your clients and somehow bootstrap the whole trust again. Import all the keys again, revoke the keys, make sure that everybody got the revocation, make sure that everybody installed the new key so you can start signing software again. So this is incredibly bad. And it's actually one of the reasons, the usability problems and the fact that it does not have advanced security properties that, to be honest, the majority of people doesn't really use GPG. And finally, it's really not integrated. So GPG, when people talk about signing the images, they, they, they mention it on its own. You should use this external tool to manually verify, or you try to integrate in your own scripts. There are package managers that do this for you, but in the large case, you actually get on your own to, to get to do this, which is actually bad. So there's this quote from the update framework uh, spec that I really like, which says that a secure software distribution is secure if you have the latest updates in a timely manner and the downloads are correct, and no harm results from checking or downloading these files. So this is actually a great goal to achieve. If we have this, we have a secure software distribution mechanism. And this is where TUF comes in. TUF is essentially an acronym for the update framework, which obviously is a play on a word with TUF, TUF security. Um, and it is really the best standard for security that we have right now. 
We did not invent this. This was made by researchers in 2009. And the curious thing about Tuff is it actually was built originally for distributing Tor. So Tor has this interesting thing, which is it has a very interesting attacker model, right? Tor is protecting against nation state attackers. It's not just your run of the mill script kitty running um, fork bombs on this online thing scrapbook, right? It is actual nation state attackers that are fighting dissidents and want to install malicious code on their, on, on their computers. And therefore, they developed a way to update the software mechanism that resisted and actually had very interesting security pro properties. And after that, they improved it. And this is where Tuff comes from. So this actually provides you some very interesting guarantees. And it has three core foundational blocks that I like to go over very quickly instead of going directly to, to, the, to the roots. But you can go to the RFC. It's actually pretty easy uh, to read and pretty easy to explain and get a concept for what this is. But the first core concept is freshness. Everything in the update framework has an expiration. And this is actually what is going to give us the ability of resisting against replay attacks. In Tough, I can always guarantee that not only your content is signed by the key that you want it to be, but I can guarantee you that you're actually getting the latest version of the software. So you can no longer serve me a two-year-old image of something that is actually signed with a key that hasn't expired yet. So that's really interesting. The second thing is that it allows us to survive key compromise. And what I mean by this is it has the notion of online and offline keys. So there's a key, which you can say it's the equivalent to your GPG key, that it is inherently more vulnerable because it has to be online signing packages. If you have to sign a package, you have to bring the key online. And if you bring the key online, then you have to sign it, and it is more exposed to be hacked and to be attacked and to be stolen, right? What Tuff gives us is it gives us another key, a more privileged key that you only need for key rotation. And therefore, since you're not doing key rotation all the time, you actually get to keep that key offline, secure. A hacker comes in, gets into the system, they cannot take your offline key because it's stored in a vault, stored in a bank, it's stored in a USB, a USB key somewhere. So this gives you survival key compromise, which is an interesting guarantee. And finally, Tuff thinks a different way. It does not think about your RPM as an individual package in isolation. Instead of thinking about files, it actually thinks about collections. And the reason for this is that there are very interesting attacks that you can do that are called mix and match attacks, in which an attacker, essentially what he does is he exploits the, the fact that you're signing individual packages and actually forces you to install different versions than what the developer actually wanted you, wanted you to install. So if there's a valid version of Nginx 1.1 and you have a valid version of your application, which is 1.0, the attacker can actually serve any combinations of these. And so you can think very quickly, I'm sure that there's a denial of service attack in there where the attacker serves an image that is not what you're expecting to run in production, and now all of a sudden things don't work. So Tuff thinks in collections instead of individual files. You're going to see that you're actually going to be able to do snapshots. Say, this is the set of files that I want to be distributed by my clients, and my clients won't see anything else. OK, so let's go into Tuff itself. How does Tuff give all, all this magic and all these magic properties? So at the core, Tuff has four different keys. Timestamps key, snapshot key, it has a target key, and it has a root key. From top to bottom, you have keys that are from shorter expiration and obviously lower sensitivity to longer expiration and higher sensitivity. In the beginning, you have the timestamp key, which is usually kept online. And since it's kept online, it's very vulnerable. And this is the key with the least privilege in the system. Compromising this key just means that you lose your freshness guarantees. It actually means that an attacker still can sign data as if they were you. And then you have a snapshot key. And the snapshot key is the thing that confers that difference between collections and individual files. It gives you, well, as the name says, a snapshot. This is the current list of files that I want, current number of versions that should work on this snapshot of the world that I want to see. Targets key is essentially the workhorse. So it would be like the equivalent to your GPG key. So it's the thing that is online signing your files. And finally, interestingly enough, these properties of key compromise come from the final key, which is the root key. And this one is the one that you should keep offline. And this is the one whose sole objective is essentially to sign the other keys in the system and to say what keys are valid at a certain moment. And this is where Notary comes in. Notary is essentially an opinionated implementation of Tuff. It uses these four keys. It actually abstracts two of them into one bundle uh, and tries to simplify a little bit. But what Notary actually does is implements the update framework. And it allows you to have access to some pretty interesting things. So it's built on top of Tuff. It's designed to essentially uh, give you simplification of this complex framework, which is tough. 
uh, is completely open source. So Apache 2.0 is completely independent from Docker itself, and you can use it for arbitrary collections of data. And it actually is giving you validation of the content. So you can have arbitrary content signed with this. You can integrate it in your own packages. I think there's one thing that I have to, to mention here, which is what Noto is doing is actually validating the publisher of the content. If you intentionally run a container that is called I am a botnet, you are going to have a bad time because Noto will verify that you really want to run this I am a botnet and it will verify the, the, the signatures, but it will still run code that you're not trusting, right? So Notary is not inspecting the images and seeing if the code that is inside of the package is malicious. So if you're downloading something from Red Hat, we'll guarantee that we got, you got what Red Hat wanted you to get. We won't guarantee that Red Hat doesn't have something malicious in it, right? This is not the job of the actual signing mechanism. So with that out of the way, the way that Notary works is pretty interesting. So you have essentially two different servers. You have Notary Signer, which keeps timestamp keys online on the cloud or on your own systems. This can be deployed on your internal network. And this is essentially what you would think of um, an HSM-backed service that has access to the keys, operates on signatures. And this service is essentially to make sure that no keys are ever on the front end. And the front end, which is the notary server, actually only has public data. So if notary server gets hacked, whatever, only has public data, it can modify anything, it can't do signature operations, it doesn't matter. Then you have your keys. You are the content publisher. So you are the only one in the system that can actually say there's new content on the system. The remote server can't do anything with it. And it's the combination of these two keys. It's a combination of the signature of your keys that are on your own laptop and the keys that are on the cloud that actually confer uh, the final bundle that is, that is valid. And there's a couple of interesting things here. The first thing is that you do not have to, ho to, to trust the thing that is hosting the content because the keys only exist on your laptop. And the only thing that we host the key for you is so we have freshness guarantees without you actually having to come online every three weeks and re-signing the content for it to be fresh. So it's just convenience. But now, now there's an interesting guarantee by doing things this way, which is an attacker to be able to have control over your content. So sign content and then publish it and have it available to everyone. Now it actually has to hack two completely distinct systems. It has to hack your online service that has your keys on a back end that is not even on a front end that you could actually host in an HSM in a hardware security module. And it has to hack either your laptop or your CI system where you have your signing keys. So essentially you just increased the, or decreased the likelihood of being compromised simultane simultaneously in both ways by a lot. Another thing that is interesting with uh, Notary is that using Tough, it allows you to do key rotation. So even if you do get hacked on one of them, timestamps gets compromised or your own key gets compromised, Notary allows you to do transparent key rotation. And what that means is, in this diagram, there's an individual with a black hat and a red key. And obviously, the black hat represents a black hat, and the red key represents a compromised key. So in this case, a key got compromised. And now the attacker is able to sign things as if they were you. Note, however, that they can't publish because they, can't have the, they actually don't have the blue key. But that's a little bit besides the point in this play, at this point. What I want to focus on is if this red key gets compromised, in a GPG scenario, your host, done. Maybe company ending event depends on how big you are, or at least a very embarrassing blog post to write. I don't want to write that blog post. With Notary, the only thing you have to do is you bring the offline key from the safe, you connect it to a secure system, you rotate the keys, you put the key back offline, and then you publish it out. And from that moment on, every single client has transparent key rotation. It sees that there's a new key that it needs to trust. It no longer trusts the red key. What does the client see? Nothing. So you got hacked. The client sees nothing. Security guarantees still apply. This is transparent key rotation and allows you to have survivable key compromise. Now the question becomes the security audience in the crew is like, OK, this sounds awesome, but what is the root of trust? It's always the question. Like, where's the root of trust? What is the first thing that you trust? How does it actually work? And in our case, we're using what I call tofus, which is essentially a play on tofu, which means trust on first use. But it has an S because the first connection is actually done via TLS and uses the public CA model. So what is happening here is when you use Notary or when we integrate into Docker, the first time you interact with the repository, 
you receive, you connect via TLS, you validate certificates, it has to have a valid public CA signed certificate. So in theory, if a hacker has the ability to sign arbitrary certificates, then you shouldn't be doing e-banking anyway. But on top of that, it trusts immediately the source of root of trust from Notary. And from that moment on, even if TLS gets compromised, you are safe. What this means that is really interesting is that after the first connection to a repository, the service that is hosting your Docker images or your RPMs or whatever content you are hosting is actually completely irrelevant. You do not have to trust the cloud because the cloud does not have the capability of signing content. Even if the server gets compromised, it does not have the ability of doing anything. So that's, that's pretty interesting. And now we come into Docker Content Trust, which is in itself an opinionated implementation of Notary. We built it this way because we know that and we want people to use Notary on its own. And so Notary is a completely independent package and we're just using it as a library, the same way that you can use it and implement it on your companies and on your products. So Notary provides a secure mechanism to retrieve content hashes. And the reason why I'm focusing on this is that in reality, what we end up, ended up doing with Notary and Docker is we use a mechanism that Docker already has, which is called pull by hash, pull by digest. And pull by digest, the way, that, the way that it works is you can do a Docker pull of Diogo Monica slash OpenVPN, and you can actually provide a digest for it to download. And what we're actually saying is, is since registry v2 is a content addressable system, the hash that you're providing is both the identifier of the data that you want and a secure cryptographic hash of the actual content. So if you're doing a pull by digest, it is always a secure operation, as long as you know the right digest to download. And this is what Notary gives you. It gives you the right digest for you to download. And so this allows you to have turtles all the way down. And now you're asking, turtles all the way down? What does this mean? What turtles all the way down means is the moment you get a manifest that you can validate as being the manifest that you want, from that moment on, it's just a hash chain. The manifest actually has the hashes of the next file that you have to download. So you're just going to do pull by digest of the next hash. And so Notary gives you the secure hash of the latest manifest that you want to download, and from that moment on, Docker does a hash chain of everything else and is able to guarantee the security of the whole system. Um, and that's amazing because it means that our integration was actually pretty simple and pretty um, uh, non-complex. And for the people that know crypto code and know security code, the least code you have, the more auditable, the better it is. The better it is. How do you enable this? So as of 1.8, you can actually enable this by exporting a content, uh, Docker Content Trust, which is an environmental variable, or using the Disable Content Trust set to false. The reason why we did this like this, I know that um, environmental variables are evil, um, the reason why we did it like this is because we want, after you give us feedback, after people start using it, after we have more operational uh, experience with the Docker Content Trust, we want to enable it as the default. And so the, the like, the, um, it, the environmental variable will go away, and the only chance that you'll have will be to opt out instead of opting in. So right now, the model is opt-in. At a future release, we would love to every single Docker pull, every single Docker build, every single Docker run come secure by default. This is the path that we're going. OK, so now I would like to demo um, Docker Content Trust working. And I'm going to jump over here. And what I have is essentially a client. So I have a client, and I'm going to do a Docker run of this client and I have a local registry that is running on port 5000, and I prepared the demo application. And so if I run this, you can see that it pulls my application, and it's running what I call CTEC Astronomy, which is just my simple app that does a bunch of things and serves a bunch of secrets. To enable Docker Content Trust, as I mentioned, the only thing you need to do is you export Docker Content Trust, and this, from this moment on, every single Docker operation is secure. There is no Docker operation that you can do that is not based on signatures. Docker pull, Docker push, Docker run, every single Docker operation is now going to have to ha operate on signatures. And to prove that, I can actually run the exact same command that I ran before, and you're going to see that it's going to say, sorry, I do not have trust available for this image. I will not run it for you. So now the question is, OK, cool. I know I have to sign this image. How easy is it to do that? And that's the beauty of the way that we built this. We wanted to build this in a way that you still get to use the normal, familiar things. And so the only thing that we're going to have to do is we have to push the content. And when we push the content, I'm going to tag it as latest. So that's the, the tag. Docker is going to do everything for us. It's going to generate four keys, roots key, targets key, snapshots key, timestamps key. And it's going to ask you for a passphrase. That's the only thing that asks you. So my passphrase is very secure, which is Diogo Diogo. Do not try to log into my Gmail with Diogo Diogo. You'll probably succeed. Oh. 
I don't know how to write my name. There you go. And it's initialized. In this passphrase that I'm providing, the only reason why we are asking you for this is because in Docker Content Trust, keys never hit um, non-temporary um, media unencrypted. So they're always key encrypting keys. So they're always encrypted on disk. In this passphrase is what you need to actually unlock it and have it decrypt. So there's no way of integrating or using the system where the key will be uh, in plain text on file. So we are very opinionated, and this was one of the opinions that we had and that we implemented. Okay, so now it's signed. So we expect this to do what? We expect Docker run to run exactly as before, and it does. So now we're running a signed image, and run works exactly as it should, and the only thing we had to do was push it. Okay, so going back to our presentation, now you're saying, okay, that sounds dandy, but prove that this system actually works without trust in the cloud. Prove that this actually does the signatures that you say that it does. And so, wow, that is very much not what I wanted. There we go. <laughs> So now I'm going to do two attacks. I'm going to demo two attacks. The first attack, I'm going to do the following. I'm going to jump on the registry. I'm going to be a man in the middle. I'm going to be on the cloud. I'm going to own all the data that is being served. And I'm going to do one thing, which is I'm going to receive a request for demo latest, and I'm actually going to serve another tag, an older tag or something like that. That's the first attack that I'm going to do. And the second attack that I'm going to do is I'm actually going to do layer tampering. So Docker pull demo latest will serve demo latest, but one of the layers will be tampered with malicious data. And then I'm going to show you how Docker actually behaves when Content Trust is enabled. Back to our demo. So I'm going to clean this window. So now we have a signed image, and we're running our signed image. So I'm going to jump into the registry by just doing docker exec. So now I'm in the registry. This is essentially the open source registry distribution that you can run. And I'm going to run this conveniently named script called hack demo. And hack demo is going to hack our actual application. So it is going to run. It's going to replace these manifests. OK? So now I'm going to run Docker again. But before I run it normally, I'm going to explicitly disable content trust. So let's make Docker operate as normal to see what would happen. So disable content, trust, and now let's see what is actually going to happen. So Docker is running without verifying the image, and we hacked the remote server. Yes, this is not our application. This is not what was intended. This is clearly an application that is malicious. Funny enough, actually, I'm just going to run that again because it's so much fun. <laughs> right? I love SL. Funny enough, if I take Disable Content Trust, and I'm, run I'm running with signatures now, right? So this is normal Docker, just normal Docker run, something interesting is going to happen. The right application runs. And this is interesting, because it might not be the expected behavior that you're, that you're expecting. You're expecting to say, this image is invalid. But in reality, Docker Content Trust bypasses all of that, because the resolution of what a correct hash is is actually done by notary on the side. So if an attacker goes to the registry and points things to different things, it doesn't matter, because we only operate on signed data, and therefore we always point to the latest, greatest version that you have available. Perfect. So let's clean this again. So now let's go to our second attack. On our second attack, I'm going to go jump back over here. What we're actually going to do is we're going to jump into the directory that is hosting one of the layers. This is the layer that is hosting. Uh, you can't see it right there, but it's A3ED. That is the actual layer ID, FS layer that is hosting. And the way that registry works, it has a file called data. And data actually contains the data that is serving down. So what I'm going to do is um, I'm going to send malicious data and send it to data. So I think we all agree that as of the moment, like this is irrecoverably malicious, right? This is completely tempered. This image should not work. So let's go back to Docker and see what Docker does. And funny enough, A3ED layer verification failed. So Docker Content Trust has said, I'm sorry, this layer is clearly malicious. I will not run it. Perfect. So now that I demoed that Docker Content Trust actually says what we say it does, and there we go again, starting from the beginning. Notary, uh, let, me, let me talk about the actual simplifications that we did. So we thought that it was really powerful, the fact that you can operate with Docker, with pull, push, one, build the normal mechanisms that you can, but using trust. The trade-off was that there is advanced features like key rotation, like actually removing tags, like doing administration on the ops part, that 
we would have to add as new Docker commands and things for people to run. So what we thought about was, okay, Docker developers and people actually operating Docker normally just need to do push-pull operations as they normally would, but the people that actually want to do key rotation and the people that actually want advanced functionality can actually download the Notary CLI. It's open source. You download Notary, and you do the operations with Notary. So complex operations on Notary, simple operations on Docker. Um, in, terms of, um, uh, in terms of future features for releases, we're actually going to add delegations which is going to allow you to have very powerful mechanisms in terms of controlling this key signs for this part of my files and this key signs for the part of my files, which is going to be really interesting. Uh, we are going to add um, a few more eye candy uh, on the server management, and we're about to release Notary 1.0 in a couple of weeks, so you can deploy it internally in your, in your networks. And finally, I think it's really important to note that we, we really we intend to, at some point after you give us feedback, to turn it on by default. Every single Docker operation should be only run on signed content. There should be no reason for us to be running unsigned content on the internet. And I think the last call and the last slide that I have is it's an open source project. It is not tied to Docker directly. Uh, we just use it as a means to actually do signing. We would love contributions. We would love review. We did one thing which we really believe in, which is we had an external company review all the crypto code. So we had the Crypto Services, NCC Group, and the very, very good Tom Ritter actually banged through our code, and we're going to publish publicly the report of this, um, of this audit uh, in a couple of weeks when we release uh, Notary 1.0. So we really believe that this is a strong solution, externally vetted, validated, that really provides very strong security guarantees. That was my talk today. Thank you very much. <laughs>